You all are in for a special treat today. I've got a really good friend of mine, Kenny Dallas, gonna be bringing the word today. Uh, I'll tell you more about him in just a moment, but his whole family is on the second row right here. I'm gonna do the embarrassing part. I want the Dallas crew to stand up. Would you say a big God bless you to them? Shannon, his wife, the kids. <laughs> Kenny and Shannon, they've got, they've, got, uh, they've got six children, six children. So I asked him, I said, man, do you love kids that much? He said, no, I just love my wife that much. Come on, somebody. And so God bless all of you. Really glad that you're here. You know, sometimes, not sometimes, oftentimes, if you're intentional, you can recognize that God will put people in your life for a reason and a season. Can I get an amen? A couple years ago, God put Kenny in my life, and uh, I'm a better person because of you. I appreciate the way that you're matter of fact, that you call me to dream bigger, to do better. You challenge me as a husband and as a father, and I'm really grateful for our friendship. Now, in a moment, Kenny's gonna come, and he's gonna lie to you. And I'm gonna tell you what the lie is. You ready? He's gonna tell you, hey, I'm just a football coach. That's what he's gonna say. And that's his past to say things that pastors can't say from the pulpit. And you're gonna hear some things today that you'd never hear from a pastor, but that's a lie in the fact that you're far more than just a football coach. You are an incredible husband, you're a tremendous dad, and you are an anointed man of God. Kenny has spoke at Man Up a couple years, and uh, every time you open your mouth, the Holy Spirit works through you and in you. He's also the founder of M46 Dads, He's written a book and a curriculum to help us dads, again, really understand what it means not just to be the provider of our home or the protector of our home, but to be the priest of our home. And so M46 comes from Malachi 4, 6, and that verse says that he will turn the hearts of the father to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. The verse goes on to say that if that doesn't happen, then there will be destruction in the land. And how many of you see that happening right here in our country right now? So our prayer for all of you dads today, all of you men today, as Coach Kenny Dallas comes in just a moment and speaks, is that your heart would go back to your heavenly father and also towards your family. It's gonna be a convicting, challenging day. Now in just a moment, you'll see a quick video to set up his message, but before we get to that moment, can we just show Coach Kenny Dallas how much we love and appreciate him? Glad you're here. Hey, and check this out. I'm gonna steal your line. Hey, listen, listen, listen. He's not six and four head coach, Kenny Dallas. He's state champion head coach, Kenny Dallas. All right, roll the video. Glad you're here, coach. God bless you. Happy Father's Day, everybody. Because I believed, because I have faith, because I am this, because I am continuing. Loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person, because he, because he. Hey, think about the thief on the cross. Oh, what an immense, I can't, I, I can't wait to find that fellow one day to ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were, you, were, you, were, you were cussing the guy out with your friend. You'd never been in a Bible study. You never got baptized. You, never, you didn't know a thing about church membership. And, and, yet, and yet, you made it. You made it. How did you make it? That's what the angel must have said, you know, like, what are you doing here? Well, I don't know. What, what do you mean you don't know? Well, because I, I don't know. Well, you know, we, uh, uh, did, uh, excuse me, let me get my supervisor. They go get the supervisor, Ranger. So we have just a few questions for you, first of all. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? <laughs> the guy said, I've never heard of it in my life. And, and what about, uh, let, let's just go to the doctrine of Scripture immediately. This guy's just staring. And eventually in frustration, he says, on, on what basis are you here? And he said, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. <laughs> now, now, that's the... That is the only answer. That is the only answer. Hey, hey. That's a couple of good videos, man. Y'all's, y'all's guys, that video earlier, I love that one right there. All right, so listen, here's, here's the deal. Go church. I'm so excited to be here with you guys today. So excited to be here with you. But I am gonna go ahead and say this. JC said it. 28 years, I've been a high school football coach. So here's the deal. If I say something dumb up here today, 100% JC's fault for asking me and putting me up here, okay? 
I'm gonna tell you all this, I love your pastor, man. I, I love your pastor. Dude, have you ever just met somebody and you're just like, dude, this dude's just a brother, man. Like he loves the Lord, he loves his family, he loves this community. And I can't remember who asked who out to the first date for to go to go uh, go grab breakfast or lunch together. But I look forward to him. Uh, I look I look forward to him all the time. He's just man, he's a brother. And so, uh, man, I'm so excited uh, to to be with you guys today. What I want to talk to you guys about for a little while is something called game changers. Uh, any of you guys who are in sports, you you guys will know what I'm talking about. There's certain things, there's certain players, there's certain times where. It's just a game changer, and, and things change, right? And, and, uh, and I'm gonna talk to you guys about one that's happened in my life about over the last year or so of something that I've learned that's a game changer for me. But before I do that, I wanna share with you a couple others, okay? That video right there, do you remember the first time you realized the dude on the, the thief on the cross, and he's right, literally he's cussing Jesus up into those last moments. I don't know what this dude did in his life, but it got him to the point where he was having capital punishment. He wasn't a good dude, was he, right? All I know up until the last moment, but you know what, I learned something, it was a game changer, like, hmm, maybe it is not so much about what you know, but it's about who you know, you know, right here. And he knew Jesus in, in his last moment. That was a game changer for me. I wanna, I wanna mention a few others to you guys. I remember reading the first time, Matthew 6, 12, um, and it says, Father, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When I became a believer, I got one of, listen, I still have one of these Bibles where it's like there's the scripture and then it explains to you. Some of us simple-minded dudes need this spot at the bottom where it then tells you, you know, what, what it's saying. But I remember as a young believer, I'm 19, 20 years old and I'm reading that for the first time and at the bottom of my Bible, you know what it says? Father, forgive us our trespasses. We uh, forgive those who trespass against us. It says this, Jesus was praying, God, forgive me in the same manner in which I forgive others. And I remember, it was a game changer for me. I've gotta be a man who's quick to forgive, not slow to forgive others, okay? It was a game, it was a game changer. I remember the time I really learned what the parable of the Good Samaritan was all about. Listen to this. Everybody knows the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Guys walking around the road, uh, some dudes come along, beat him up, take his money, leave him kind of, for dead on the side of the road, and then two guys come through, and what do they do? They go to the other side of the road, until somebody pointed out to me it was a priest and a Levite. And you know what they, they said? So this guy who was teaching me this, he goes, you know what probably what was happening? One of them was probably coming from worship, right? And the other one was probably going to worship. And Jesus said, don't necessarily be like those dudes, right? Be like the Samaritan who was absolutely the least of least. I mean, a throwaway dude, whoever you most disrespect in society, he goes, that's the man to be like. So maybe it's not all about appearances, you know, like how many times I'm at church or coming from church or what you think about me. He said, I want you to be like the Samaritan who will go to that side of the road. And dude, maybe there's more of life on that side of the road than there is on that side of the road. You know what I'm saying? All right, that was a game changer. Here, here's another one. I remember reading all the times Jesus would say crazy, I wanted to say crazy crap, I probably shouldn't say it. He would say crazy stuff to people. And like you guys, like you would think, if I'm trying to create a big crowd, what do I do? I say stuff that you wanna hear. Jesus didn't do that. He said stuff that almost made people leave and go away, but he was telling them true things and true things that they needed. He was like living water, living bread. It wasn't necessarily what I wanted to hear. He was telling them what they needed to hear. I actually, my wife here, Shannon, we've been married 29 years. We've known each other, we've known each other since fifth or sixth grade, I think, something like that. We started dating when we were, we were 15 years old, 16 years old. We were juniors in high school. The only thing bad I can say about my wife is, I've said this before, she shouldn't have been hanging out with me when she hung out with me my junior year. Any of you men have the same testimony? You're glad your wife started hanging out with you when she probably shouldn't have hung out with you or whatnot? But listen, I remember Shannon telling me one day, like she grew up in church her whole life knowing stories of Jesus, but I remember her saying, the first time you had ever read the Gospels for yourself, she was like, I don't know if I like this Jesus as much. Like, the, the, I think the Jesus she had was like he sat around petting lambs all day long. You know, let the children come unto me and pet my lamb up here. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here's the dude who's just telling folks the truth. Like, and he, and he was direct with them. 
And, uh, and, and listen, I, I think about this. In fact, think about the guys that he dealt with so directly. You would think this dude, he, like he's supposed to get after all those sinners. What did he do with the sinners? He hung out with them, man. Like me and JC, we go to the Waffle House together. Dude, he's going to the Waffle House with the, with the sinners. You know who it was? You know who it was that he dealt the most harshly with? The religiously powerful. The people that used God to control people and to control their minds and their actions and their whatever. That's who Jesus dealt with. That was a game changer for me, right? He didn't go out there attacking all the sinners. He went out to the people trying to, trying to abuse and take advantage of, of other people. Um, man, this was a huge one. Luke chapter 22, I've actually talked that man up about, about this verse. I could say, man, it's my favorite verse in the Bible. My wife always says, be careful, like you say that about like 10, 15, I was like, in the moment, it's what I mean, I'm telling the truth, all right? Morally telling the truth. All right, so listen, here's the deal. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus is getting ready to die, right? It's, he's in his, he's in his la it's actually it's his last night, and he's telling all of his disciples they're having dinner, this is what's gonna happen to me. I'm gonna get arrested. I'm gonna get beaten. I'm gonna be mistreated. Uh, ultimately, I'm gonna die. And he tells Peter, in fact, Peter, you're gonna deny me three times. You guys know this story? Does anybody know what Peter told Jesus? He's like, Jesus, I would go to jail for you and I would die. In other words, Peter was like, shut up, Jesus. This is what I'll do for you. Like, I'll die for you, sucker, right? I'm not gonna deny you. What do we know ends up happening? By the way, the first opportunity he has to deny Jesus is front of, in front of a little servant girl, and he wilts, right? But there's an unbelievable passage in Luke 22, I think it's verse 32, and it says this, Jesus said, and Peter, I have prayed for your faith that you might not fail. But listen, but when you have returned, strengthen the brothers. I, I'm sure I have read that many, many times, but by the way, a man who lives past some failures in his life, maybe not before or some deep failures in his life, may brush over the fact that Jesus knew he was about to what? In fact, he wasn't done with Peter. He's like, oh, I got so many. After you think it's over, Peter, after you have screwed up, failed, and you have messed up in the worst way, and you think you've lost all of life, now it's time to go strengthen the brothers. Everybody on the same page? This is a game changer. It's an absolute game changer for me that God's not done when I think I'm done or I've done something dumb or on and on and on and on. You fill in the blank your own life story. You live long enough, you've done some dumb crap, right? All right, so here we go. Here's the last thing, or next to last thing. Matthew 25, 45 says this. Jesus said he was a game changer. How you treat the least of these is how you treat me. And I had somebody point out, but I, I, that kind of like it sounds nice and all, how you treat the least of these. Oh man, what a compassionate man. Kind of, my daughter's always on me like, do you know what the word empathy is? It means whatever. So <laughs> like I, I've, I can define it maybe for you, but uh, get right, do right. All right, but listen, uh, I had somebody point out to me this. You know what the least of these, what can they do for you? Nothing. I wanna say jack crap, nothing. I, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> nothing. They can do jack, nothing for you, right? By the way, who is it that we generally honor? People that can do something for us. My boss. Dang, if we had a senator to walk in the room, if we had a blah, 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 what? You know what I'm saying? Like powerful CEOs and this, that, the other. Jesus said, I relate to the people that can't do anything for you. How you treat them, that's how you treat me. It's a game changer for me to open my eyes. Like, his kingdom doesn't work the way my kingdom appears to work or how I've been taught it. What, you, you understand what I'm saying? It's a game changer, all right? Uh, next to last one. And I, oh, I love this one right here. Listen. If you guys go to Luke chapter 15, you go to a great parable. It's the parable of the prodigal son. In fact, if you open your Bibles and you look at Luke chapter 15, it'll cut it, at least in my Bible, it's titled The Parable of the Prodigal Son, or it says The Parable of the Lost Son. Do you know at the, I had this pointed out to me a few years back? It's unbelievable. Do you know that beginning, beginning of that chapter, if you look at Luke chapter 15, who he's talking to, it says Jesus began to speak, listen, to the sinner's 
and the, and the tax collectors, all right, there's one crowd, and the scribes and the Pharisees. So he's talking to two groups of people. Listen to this, listen to this. So he goes on to tell them a couple of stories, okay? And I'm actually gonna refer back to Luke 15 later, later in my talk, but listen, in this story of the prodigal, of uh, the, the story of the prodigal son, you guys know what happens? We all call it the, pro, the story of the prodigal son, the story of the lost son. You know how Jesus said? Jesus said, let me tell you a story about two sons. Why is it that through our filter, I think, honestly, some of it is our, we gotta be careful of our own like kind of pharisaical way that we look at the gospel and all of that stuff. Oh, this is a story about a bad kid. Because what that bad kid do? He's like, Dad, I wish you'd be dead. Give me my money. He goes out, he spends it on women and loose living. It's crazy. He ends up losing it all. He ends up working for a dude. He's in the middle. I mean, he's literally laying, like, and he was in the middle of nothing. All the friends magically disappeared because the funds have disappeared. No fun. And he's sitting around going, I just wish I was at home. I, I just, I'll be a servant for my dad is better than this crap that I'm living in right now. What am I doing? Like, what am I doing? And so what happens? He comes home and we know the story. What does his daddy do? Boom. And listen, it's a picture of God's love. I don't even think that's the point of the story because he keeps on talking after that. And he says, what was the reaction though of the older son? Does anybody know? Because it's the story of two sons. Son, you know, what is it? He says, he doesn't even come inside the house. He's mad. In fact, he says, I've done good my entire life. You've never thrown me a party like this. And listen, the story ends, we don't even know if the son comes in the house for the celebration. There's a party going on and he's outside pouting. You know why? I've done good my whole life and you hadn't even, and listen, the, the dad says, everything I have is yours. But listen, I think part of what we're trying to understand in that story is maybe there's two ways to be far from God. There's a way to be far from God when I'm really, really bad, and there's a way to be far from God when I think that I'm what? Really, really good. You know what I'm saying? And those are two, and I think it's exactly what Jesus is telling the, the Pharisees and the tax collector, I mean, the, the, the tax collectors and the sinners, but also the Pharisees and the scribes. There's two ways to be far from God, okay? So, all of these were game changers. I'm gonna give you one more game changer that's a stat. Even though this is Father's Day, and that's normally what I do. Listen, my life for the last 28 years, I spent, I'm a high school football coach, so I, 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 I speak to 16-year-old idiot boys. This is what I do, man. And I can call them an idiot because I was a 16-year-old idiot too. And so it's, I say words like listen and stuff like that real sharp, and you would too for the last 28 years. You're talking, talking to, you know, 116 year old boys that don't know how to listen, you'd say, you'd, you'd speak real sharply too. But, um, but it, it, here's the thing, here's the thing. This message is not really just for daddies, but daddies, I'm about to drop a stat on you that you gotta deal with right now. Every single one of you guys sitting here, you gotta deal with this stat, okay? Here it is. A child who comes to Christ, a child who comes to Christ, the rest of their family comes to Christ 6% of the time, okay? So there's, a, there's an impact there. And by the way, this is not a negative stat towards you mamas anyway. This is a stat I'm trying to, I'm trying to have the dads understand that the, you know, their, their influence. A mama comes to Christ. The rest of the family comes to Christ 17% of the time after a mama comes to Christ. A daddy comes to Christ 93% of the time. The rest of the immediate family comes to know Christ. And so listen, game changer dads. Game changer, JC said it, you're not just provider and protector. And listen, good for you for being provider and protector. And that is a, it's not a terrible definition for daddy, but God also created you to be the priest of your own home too. So I want you guys to listen. I want you to listen as I talk about today's game changer, okay, that, that, I, that I really wanna hit with you, okay? And I'm gonna do it through looking at a chapter that every one of us could probably recite. In fact, as I'm saying through it, if you, if you remember it, go ahead and say it with me. Because if there's two things we probably memorize, kind of grow it up, it's probably John 3, 16 and the 23rd Psalm, right? Those are kind of like the parts where you start. So here we go. I want you guys to listen. Here goes the 23rd Psalm. Say it with me if you know it. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. 
He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's not a new verse for anybody, or set of scripture for anybody, is it? We've heard the 23rd Psalm. In fact, a lot of you guys, you may not be able to say it, but just hearing it, you probably could kind of put those key words in all throughout it because we're that, we're that familiar with it. Guys, about a year ago, someone showed me in this scripture that was an absolute game changer that I, I wanna share with you. And it goes back to this little verse right here. I think it's verse six where it says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Guys, will you lock in and hear something here for just a second? The word surely, we're gonna take a look at a couple of these words. The Hebrew word surely means this, indeed, absolutely, beyond any doubt, exclamation point. So listen, he's about to say something and he's gonna say, beyond any doubt, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. Everybody on the same page. He says, goodness and mercy, beyond any doubt, Goodness and mercy, goodness is the Hebrew word that means this, abundant blessing, lavish benefits, spiritual prosperity. Now, here, here's what he's saying, goodness, God's goodness, his spiritual prosperity, and I don't even want you guys to hear that as financial prosperity. I think sometimes we just, we conflate those things uh, you, know, you know, too much. I think there's a greater thing that's even here. In fact, he even says it, through part of your life, Yea, though you walk through the valley of the what? The shadow of death. Dude's probably not, I don't know if he's doing real well at that time, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. There's something else that's at work here. I heard this on social media the other day. Sometimes it pops in your head, you're like, man, is that the Holy Spirit or are you just talking? But listen, um, I, I, I saw this on social media the other day, it was so good. It was a guy talking to another guy, some of y'all may have seen this, and he said, hey, if I gave you a million dollars, would you be happy for a few days? He goes, for a few days? Yeah, man, yeah, I'd definitely be happy. And he said, seriously, like, like you, you could be happy for a while with a million dollars? Yeah, I'd be happy with a million dollars. He said, it, it's your lucky day. What if I said, I'm gonna give you $10 million? He goes, oh yeah, I'd be really happy. He said, but the only catch is, the only catch is, I'm gonna give you 10 millions today, but tomorrow morning you don't wake up. Anybody turn down the money immediately? Listen, and the guy immediately said, I, dude, I wouldn't take that deal. I would take, he said, so you're telling me waking up tomorrow morning is worth more to you than $10 million. Listen, then he was like, stinking live like it. Now, he actually used the expletive, would actually, actually kind of worked. He was like, blank it, live like it, whatever. It actually helped the whole thing for me. But listen, <laughs> but you, you, you kind of get the point. He was like, so when you wake up tomorrow morning, Live like, so in other words, what I'm trying to say here is he's saying goodness, I don't even want you to just think it's money because none of us would take any amount of money to not wake up in the morning, tomorrow morning. Everybody on the same page? Listen, goodness and mercy. Mercy is the Hebrew word has said that is God's unconditional, undeserved, loyal love for us. Listen, I, I don't know everybody's story in here. I don't know how much has said you have in your life, unconditional, undeserved, loyal love. It's a beautiful thing. I want you to understand this. He was saying, believe this, son, believe this. Listen, without a shadow of a doubt, God's spiritual prosperity, his unconditional, undeserved, loyal love for us, and here's the word, because I, I, I love all of that, but here's the game changer. The next word is he said, surely goodness and mercy will what? follow you all the days of your life. Who showed me this, who pointed this out. Listen to what the Hebrew word follow means. It's R-A-D-A-P, it's a Hebrew word. It means this, to pursue after, to run after, to chase after. You know what this guy told me? He said, to choose the word follow after you hear, after you hear pursue after, run after, chase after, that's a terrible word. That's such a passive word to you. Listen, when I say follow, doesn't it, it kind of sound like, uh, it's like my puppy. 
is follow me. Like, come on, Charlie, good, good boy. You know, follow me, follow me here. You, you kind of get what I'm saying? Like, God's spiritual prosperity, his, his undeserving covenant, beautiful, pursuing love for me, his loyal love for me, he's saying it doesn't just follow you. Listen, it doesn't just follow you. It pursues after you. It runs after you. It chases after you. Man, can I go so far as to say this? It is hunting after us. That sounds like a better word to me than follow. In fact, C.S. Lewis, you guys know who C.S. Lewis is, Chronicles of Narnia, all that, all that stuff. C.S. Lewis described God as the great hound of heaven. Maybe he's not this little puppy, right? In fact, C.S. Lewis goes on to say, oh yeah, he's good, but listen, he's not safe. Man, he's pursuing, he's pursuing me. So listen, right now, and I can't talk to you ladies, never been one, but all you dudes, listen to what I'm telling you. I meet dudes all the time who don't think they're worthy to step inside of a church. They're like, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the bad decisions I've made. There's dudes who think like, dude, I gotta be all cleaned up and I gotta be all right to be here. No, you don't. Listen, that may be what the Pharisees have told you that you have to do, but you need to understand this. I had it explained this way. If this place was like a car dealership, you ever been to a car dealership before? Out in front is the show, is the, it's the what do they call that? The, uh, the showroom. Listen, if I was gonna drive a clunker up there, you may feel like, well, I can't take it to the showroom. Dang, look at all these beautiful cars. Guess what? The church, it ain't so much the showroom. You know what the church is? It's the shop out back, right? Now, I'll take my clunker to the shop in back to work on. I got a problem with my engine. I got a problem with my transmission. I got a problem with my, what, you guys understand what I'm saying? So listen, this thing, what it's not supposed to be, I don't think the church is supposed to be some kind of museum of holiness. You know what I'm saying? Listen, it's a hospital, right? And listen, here's the great news. I know that God is pursuing you today because your butt is sitting in here right now. Something has happened to where you're sitting in here right now. He's still pursuing. And listen, you gotta deal with that. You gotta deal with that. But I, I'm just telling you, as I have lived a little bit, here's what I kind of think. I think he has, and I, I read this quote, and I think it's true. I think he has a single relentless stance towards us. He loves you. That's his single relentless stance is that he loves you and he will chase, he will run, he will pursue. In fact, let me point you to Luke chapter 15. Remember how I was talking about the parable of the prodigal son earlier? There's two other stories he tells in Luke 15. Does everybody remember who he was talking to? Talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the, to the Pharisees and scribes. All you guys who think you got all your junk all together, right? We got it. You got all the power. You know you're telling everybody how awesome and how great you are. I know who you are. And then I got these two over here. You got the tax collectors and sinners. Dudes who know. Dudes who know they got no reputation out there, okay? So he's talking to the full gamut, and he tells them two other stories. You know one of them. One of the stories probably, it's the story of the hundred sheep. One sheep is lost. What does the shepherd do? He leaves the what? To go after the one. And then right after that, he tells a story of a, of a widow who's got a bunch of coins, and then she realized she's lost the coin. She, she leaves her coins, and she goes after what? The lost coin. Now listen, here's what was pointed out to me about this word follow, pursue. It's not follow, but it's pursue, chase, hunt. You know what the guy who, and, and listen, I was always taught, and I always thought, that's a straight salvation uh, passage. And maybe this, JC get up there and was like, he had no idea what he was talking about theologically. It was, it was straight, may, may, and may, maybe it is, but you know what was pointed out to me? Maybe there's a broader meaning to that because I want you to think about this. How did the shepherd even know that that one sheep was lost? Because at one point there was what? A hundred of them suckers. And now there was just 99. And what was the response of the shepherd? To go after the one. It's a picture of God's relentless love. It's a picture that he is on the hunt. I'm, listen, that sheep ain't hunting for the shepherd. And you may not be hunting for him today. He's hunting for you because he loves you. And there's only one way that God deals with this, and it's with his covenant love. 
looking at us. Does that make sense? And so listen, how did the widow know that a coin was missing? Because at one point she had all these coins and then now she's got one left and she's got one less. So she leaves it to go after it. So listen, here's the challenge I wanna give to you guys. I'm the sheep, I'm the coin. And at times, like, am I the only dude that wanders in here? Like, is your heart prone to wander even though I know the goodness of God, even though I know what is right and what is wrong? Are you not prone to, you guys understand what I'm saying, right? Hey, the apostle Paul, he said it this way. He said it this way, listen to this. The apostle Paul said in, in Romans chapter seven, he said, for I do not understand what I'm doing because I do not practice what I want to do, but I do what I hate. So I discover this law. When I want to do what is good, evil is still present with me. For in my inner self, I delight in God's law. He's like, I know I delight in God's law. I know I want to honor God, but I see a different law in the parts of my body waging war against this law of my mind and taking me prisoner to the law of sin and parts of my body. What a wretched man I am. This dude wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Be careful that we make ourselves to have this thing all figured out and look perfect just because I said I'm a follower of Jesus. Hey, uh, uh, worship team, will you guys come on up here for a second? I don't do this very often. Uh, worship team, where y'all at? Come on, come on. Oh, y'all already up here? Okay, sorry. Hey, worship, worship team, let's go. We got stuff to do. Hey, so, so listen, I don't do this very often, but I, this, I, there is a, a worship song that I have been singing over and over and over that speaks to this exactly thing, okay? And in fact, my knuckleheaded seventh grade going into eighth grade son, Zags, like this past week, he's like, Dad, this song already, I've heard it enough times. And you know, I'm like, Zach, you're just a dumb little eighth grader. You ain't lived long enough to understand the importance of this song. Dude, you ain't walked through the valley of the shadow of death yet. Listen, one day you'll be able to praise Jesus like this. You can't praise Jesus like this yet because you, listen, may, you maybe haven't been the sheep and you haven't been the lost coin yet. Like you don't know that he pursues, listen, even when I don't deserve it and I don't even want to be pursued. So listen, we're gonna sing something in a minute and it's gonna say, and he's gonna say, you're running after me. His goodness, it's running after me. Listen. I am the world's worst at lyrics. My wife can tell you. I feel like the people who wrote songs, it's just their opinion as to what the words of it is. I'll sing any words I feel like to any song. Like, they'll tell you. But this song, we need to listen to the words of this. And I wanna go past that. The word worship means focus. Hey, this song, dudes that are in this room who don't feel worthy to be in a church building right now, or dudes in this building who think, I've just done too much. You just don't know what I've done. You don't know what my past is. You don't know what I've, listen. Listen to how the, how, how the great hound of heaven is pursuing you and let's worship together right here real quick. In all my life you have been faithful. In all
Y'all can sit down. I'm going to yell at you for like one more minute. <laughs> so Paul at the end of chapter seven is like, what am I going to do with myself? Like, I know I want to honor God. Why do I keep doing what I know I'm not supposed to be doing? Why do I even want to be doing that? What am I doing? But he, even, he ends by saying, who will rescue me from this body of death? This dude wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Don't tell me you got everything figured out yet. Or at least listen, you're just not a dude I can learn from because I can't relate to you if you've got it all figured out. But here was the answer. And I love Romans chapter eight. Listen, my kids, they'll tell you. Listen, for the last year, probably the only Devo we ever have comes out of Romans chapter eight. And they're like, heard it, dad. Yep, about to hear it again. Romans chapter eight. I'm not gonna read all of it to you, but listen to parts of it. Listen to his answer, because he goes on to say, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. What the law could not do, since it was weakened by the flesh, God did it. He condemns sin in the flesh by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and was a sin offering for us. Listen, for all those things, listen, for all those led by, the, by God's spirit are God's sons. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you've received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, the Spirit Himself testifies together with our spirit that we are God's children. Son, I added the son, that wasn't in there. Listen to this part. For the creation eagerly awaits with anticip anticipation for God's sons to be revealed. You know creation sitting on the edge of its seat? Like just waiting for you men to be revealed, right? Waiting, and, and, and girls, and boys and girls, everybody, waiting for God's children to be revealed. It's sitting on the edge of its seat, waiting for it to be revealed. Listen, but then, I'll fast forward here, but then what, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Listen, who can bring an accusation against God's men, against God's people? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more so, he's been raised and he also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth. And then he goes, nor anything else in all creation. I think he did a pretty good list. He was like, if I missed it, there it is. Listen, nor anything in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Listen to me today. He has a single, relentless stance towards you. He loves you. He loves you. And even when it's not reciprocated, when you're too weak, when you're too willful, when you're too whatever you want to put in there, he will pursue. He will run. He will chase, he will hunt, because he's the great hound of heaven. And it's why you're sitting right here today, 
because he loves you. Can I pray for us? God, thank you that you love me even when I don't love you in return. God, I'm blown away by how you pursue me. I'm blown away by how you see me. God, I, I don't even know what to say about that other than here. Here's all I have. Here I am. I surrender it to you. And God, help me then show others what that love looks like. God, I pray for JC. I pray for Go Church. I pray for their impact in this community. God, I pray for daddies that are in this room and for mamas in this room and for children that's in this room. Lord, may we honor you with our lives, Father. God, thank you for pursuing us. In Jesus' name, amen.